uh, good afternoon, everyone, or whatever time it is in your corner of the world. Uh, welcome to Actionable Co uh, Innovations. Um, this is our third conversation in a series to kick off um, a regular meeting that we're going to be hosting once a week. Um, and today we're going to be talking about the future of ed tech. We, this is the third in a series where we've been trying to kind of lay down um, a foundation to reflect upon teaching and learning in the age of COVID-19. And we started out with Don Buckley, who was talking um, a little bit about his experiences. And then we talked about the design of learning experiences with Amy Yurko. And today we're joined by two great people that I will introduce in a moment. If you're not sure what innovations, um, actionable innovations is, we are a brand new professional learning community for those who are looking to um, kind of push the boundaries of teaching and learning. We are looking for ed leaders to join us who are interested in talking and writing and potentially consulting on um, innovation in general in schools. So you're welcome to participate at any level. If you wanna know more about it, you can always get in touch with me. But basically this is what we do. We host conversations like this. We write about educational innovations in um, the platform called Medium. And we're hoping to evolve this into a consulting group that can service, be a full service consultancy to schools. But we'll see if that happens or not. Uh, next slide. So you can find us at actionableinnovations.global. Um, and you can read more about the people who are part of our group. We've got several of them in the room right now. If they can raise their hands and wave, uh, that would be great. And we're always looking for more people to kind of join and help with the, the heavy lifting a little bit too. So let me know if you're interested in that. And then the next slide, uh, you can follow us on lots of different platforms. We have a website, um, our Medium blog, uh, all sorts of social media things. And you can find it all in one place at Linktree slash actionable inno. So there's a poll, uh, Stephanie and Alex who are going to be presenting today have a poll that is going right now and it would be great if you could uh, weigh in and um, say uh, if your organization is progressing or regressing in terms of its integration of technology at this stage of the pandemic. Uh, I think it's, it's gonna be a challenge for schools to rethink again, how they're using technology and hopefully they're making progress as opposed to regressing, but it'll be interesting to see the results there. And then I'm gonna turn this over to Alex and Stephanie. And I know Alex uh, Pachowski from my work with internet, uh, with, with um, independent schools. We're part of a listserv called the ISED listserv that has been instrumental in my career. And I think Alex would agree that it's been a, a, rate, a really great professional learning community for people who are working in private, independent, and international schools. Uh, and so he's also been active in COSIN and we've known each other online for a number of years. And I'm so glad to have him as part of this group because his technical expertise is, is phenomenal. And he has, I hope he's gonna tell his great story about his Zoom bomber today too, that I think is- Stop giving is, away the end of the, end okay, of the presentation. Okay, or it's great, it's an amazing story. And then Stephanie, I've known for a long time with her work from with METC, which I have keynoted their conference several years ago. They were very kind to me. And Stephanie just, just finished her doctorate. So hooray for Stephanie. She's now a Dr. Madligar. And uh, we're super proud of her and excited for her. And her specialty is social emotional learning along with technology. So um, I'm really excited about this opportunity for everyone to get to know each other and I'm going to let them take it away. So take it away, Alex and Stephanie. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just jump off with a little bit more detailed introduction. Um, thank you, Lucy, for, for your kind words. Uh, I am Alex Pachowski. I'm currently the Director of Educational and Information Technology um, at North Broward Preparatory School in Coconut Creek, Florida. I have done IT in education in some way, shape, or form for about 28 years now, uh, working through higher ed and a whole lot of really interesting stuff at Rutgers University, and working also as the CIO at Oak Knoll School of the Holy Child, a very small independent school um, with a lot of uh, great people and great opportunities, and now here in uh, Florida with a lot of, uh, again, great people and some really, really unique um, 
learning processes and learning support systems. Um, this is uh, the picture I have is just a little uh, fun piece going in Florida. I still I moved from New Jersey to Florida and I have basically been here and still have yet to see a rocket launch or anything else with a degree. My degrees are actually in rocket sciences, so I can actually say I'm a rocket scientist. It takes a rocket scientist to do my job most of the time. Um, and I'm always looking for sort of the unique piece of where we can introduce creativity into what we do in our learning and what we do in our technology processes. Uh, I think it's a great, a great opportunity. We have a great opportunity right now to be extremely creative about how ed tech gets used and how ed tech beca can become the foundation for what would be the next evolution of learning. Um, so Stephanie, why don't you take it away as I continue on? All right, thanks, Alex, and thanks also to Lucy. Uh, as uh, previously mentioned, my name is Stephanie Madliger, and um, most uh, recently, Dr. Madliger, that I'm excited about. Uh, and as Lucy said, uh, yes, it's social emotional ed tech, um, more formally, uh, buzzword is digital citizenship, digital wellness was my dissertation. Um, I have been in education for about the same 28, 29 years. First half was in K-12 education and um, as far as teaching and learning, uh, central office, instructional coach, et cetera. And then my last half has been with an education service agency called Education Plus in the St. Louis area. So I am the director of educational innovation. And as Lucy said, the ed tech piece or component of ed plus is called METC. And METC is a uh, the Missouri ISTE affiliate. So we have COSIN and ISTE and many ed tech organizations we'll be talking about today. So we wanted to make sure that that was uh, first and foremost so that you have resources beyond us uh, after you leave us. And from there, Alex, I'm gonna let you keep going. All right, so I'm gonna share the results from the poll um, so that people can see them um, from the, is your organization progressing or regressing? I'm going to expect the integration of technology and we're about what I, I actually this is the opposite of what I was expecting. I don't know about what what you were expecting, Stephanie, but I was expecting about a, the two thirds, one third in the opposite direction uh, with many regressing in terms of what conversations that I've had online with a lot of schools and a lot of people. Um, I'm actually encouraged to see that people feel that they're progressing um, with the use of technology. Uh, what do you, I mean, what did you yeah, I, I agree. I think they several in our area in Missouri, because uh, we've got rural, urban, suburban, we had some pulling the reins back for, per se this year, just honestly to catch the breath. Uh, so I, I, I anticipate that to be continued on, but I think the, the overarching was really let's focus on ourselves, let's focus on um, the wellness piece. Um, before we can go on with that. But I, I do think that it will continue to progress after after we get that foundation. It was a little cracked for a little while to per se. <laughs> Agreed. So I wanna build off of, for those who um, have been along for the, the ride since we started, um, we've had some really great uh, discussions already on um, design thinking and innovative space. And I'm gonna sort of pull us in from um, our previous session from Amy last week, last week on physical spaces and talk about some of the, I'll call it the great strides that we've made and maybe a few of the challenges that we still have in terms of space. I mean, when people are looking at spaces now, we have these great, amazing concepts of trying to figure out how we can use flexible spaces and use rooms for multi-purposes and everything's now on wheels and things are, can be moved around the room. Um, we have dedicated technology setups in lots of places where things are, can be virtual or you have your maker spaces with all your toolkits and your labs and all your other pieces. And we've done it, I think overall, as a, as a whole, we've done a great job of introducing different, differing technologies into the learning environment. But I think one of the biggest challenges that I think we still do while we create these spaces that are new 
And while we have the opportunity to put some of these in when we're renovating or designing from scratch, or we're lucky enough to get a big grant, I think the bigger challenge comes from what we see when we're in our regular day-to-day -day classrooms. And that, you know, stealing, again, stealing from, from Amy a little bit, we still, when we have the option, we still stick kids in columns and rows and we put them in groupings and do it. And we even replicate that when we go online. Um, I, the thing that has driven, one of the things that has driven me nuts as we've done the digital classrooms and you have the thing is the, you know, uh, either the Brady Bunch thing, or we've actually recreated the classroom to sit them in columns and rows so that we can see them as we expect them, as opposed to working with students to use the technology to drive a different paradigm. In probably in two, I'm going to say based on the timing, in two of these three classrooms, you probably have, or assuming that the other, the Zoom classroom could be a real classroom, you've got devices, you've got Wi-Fi, you've got a projector, you've probably got some other type of, of technology that's sitting there. And we still insist on the teacher in the front of the room, the teacher doing a lecture to students, the teacher providing all of the resources in paper, the teacher still putting out the, the I mean, I'm at this point only because we do, rep, most people probably do report cards and everything man, uh, digitally now, there's no lesson plan books, but I'm sure in a lot of schools, those still exist as the actual backup to the digital system. And we're not taking advantage of what we should be doing in the classroom to change the way that we look at how classes should interact, how classes should operate, and what we should be doing to leverage the technology. Um, one of the reasons I'm at the school I'm in right now is because I loved when talking to people here, the opportunity to choose the, the when they did their design for what they wanted to see in the classroom, they chose pedagogy first and then picked some technology to do what they wanted to do with their pedagogy. And I have, in discussing it with schools, it's really amazing um, to see what you can do when you, when you have that, when you make your classroom about what you're teaching versus what you're trying to do. I don't think in, in a handful of classrooms, I think we still have a, a um, you know, column and row model, but some of that's for right now spacing and, and COVID purposes. But in many cases, we still have dividers up and we have kids in pods and we have stations around the classroom. And I'm not just talking about where we are in kindergarten. Uh, I'm talking about where we are in middle school and even in the high school for certain things um, to make it so that we are going with the learning that we need to do and the systems that we have versus what we really want to to drive in terms of the space. I'm gonna move on. This is, you know, the idea is to be digital ready and the, you know, full disclosure, I took these pictures, one's my daughter and one's from, a, from one of my schools. Um, looking at what's happened over the last two years, um, there are schools that have been ready for doing digital and the pandemic just made them shift a little bit in terms of how they deliver. And then there are schools that sat there with boxes and boxes of computers, not ready to do anything with them, and then all of a sudden realize they might have to go digital, which the paradigm that we need to start working on, and this is the, you know, how to not let a, a crisis get away from us, is we want to figure out how to make it sustainable that the classwork that we want to do is the classwork that we're providing in a digital format and with the support systems in place. Uh, one of the things that I have been a proponent of for a very long time is keeping your infrastructure ready for what's coming. Um, from an IT guy perspective, that what most people take that as is making sure that you have your Wi-Fi, making sure that you have enough connectivity in your rooms, making sure your internet connection is up. You know, if you have a one-to-one -one program, making sure that you know you've got some of the software that you need, or you got antivirus and the 
what's your repair process on the devices. And that's all well and good. And that's a, a base foundation for where you want to go. But it's that next step of what does the learning actually look like on the devices? Do you have a, um, I, what do you have, like, what do you have that actually gives you a better learning environment? Do you have a learning management system? It doesn't matter if everybody has a device, if you have to email everything every time you want to get things out. Do you have a way to communicate with everybody? How do you set up your, how do you have people set up groups? Which ways do you do your, how do you do your communications online to make sure that everyone's in a, in your community environment, to make sure that things are happening the way that you want them to. You want to make sure that you've got that sustainability of the infrastructure and the devices and how things are supposed to run, as well as develop additional functionalities in terms of piling on the, the systems and the services and the software that people need. Um, this is a picture of my daughter getting ready for the first day of school last year in the middle of the pandemic. Now we're a we're a one to one school with iPads, but as you can see, she's got three devices sitting there. She's with her friends on one device. She's watching the class on another device, and she's inputting her stuff on another device. That's what being you know to me digital ready was ready was was about. Versus uh, the next picture, which to be fair isn't what I'm going to be di exactly talking about. This is a shipment of laptops that came in as we would distribute in the summer that we would distribute to students. But as I watched the pandemic, you know, unfold and, and people respond with their systems and their in their school districts, um, it was a lot of we don't know how we're going to do this. We're spending the next month or two figuring it out, and then magically, school districts would would all of a sudden within a month or two find twenty five thousand, fifty thousand, seventy five thousand devices for their students um, to be able to roll out and sort of be ready with some software and some training, um, which is basically to me means that, you know, most school districts can't process that large an order and most distributors can't deliver that large an order to that many places in the middle of a pandemic. That means that these devices were literally sitting there in a closet somewhere waiting to be used instead of actually being out there to be used by students on a regular basis. And that's, to me, that's the, the, the crime of the crime against innovation um, to basically you had the, you had the devices, you had the ability to be prepared for this type of situation and to encourage students to be digital and to learn through their computers and to learn with computer based aids. And it wasn't being taken advantage of. And if I if you go back and look at, you know, school districts that, you know, maybe the one you work in. What was, you know, how did your school respond to this? What was it, what was it that made your district change the direction? And how easy were they, how easy was it to pivot? Um, again, for my school in an independent school, we closed down for spring break. We closed for one day. We trained everybody on Zoom. We turned around and we opened up again because Zoom and the and the the delivery medium was the only piece that we had to really teach everybody because we were already had a number of the tools that we were gonna be, end up relying on over the next 18 months. Um, and schools who were sitting with the devices in a closet were waiting for a, for a really long period of time. Um, I think in our region, Alex, and I know others can follow. So in the St. Louis, Missouri region, what doesn't matter whether we're urban or suburban, um it was like your 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 pictures of the boxes is kind of like the and you get a pizza and you get a pizza you, know, you get a computer <laughs> is kind of what happened uh wherever the computers were coming from and so i think that's that's kind of the reaction or reactor reactory uh way of thinking that the it the leaders everybody kind of got on board because you had to so I think the uh, images you have there, this one and the previous one, talking about space and talking about the technology infrastructure, uh, bringing in both Amy's space conversation and how the environment is part of the design process of instruction, including what Don talked about as far as uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll be talking about some of the things that he shared and as far as how can we get to that next piece Design comes in lots of ways and lots of sizes. 
So I think for sure in our region, again, most people uh, had a reactionary. Uh, maybe it was e-learning is was more like emergency learning versus uh, true e-learning, electronic learning. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anybody else um, wants to talk about how their organizations reacted or what how things were done immediately as this uh, Lucy's putting some things in the chat. So feel free to put it in the chat. Yeah, and I want to respond to a couple these. of things yeah. that Lucy and Bill uh, had mentioned. And I agree that the, the learning management systems, we can do a whole, and maybe we should do in the future, a whole debate on on them. Um, I still use the, I use the learning. I agree with you that a lot of it, it really is content management versus the, uh, versus the actual learning management. But that's the that's the nomenclature that they sell the platforms under. So because content management goes for websites and learning management goes for classrooms, we have to come up with something much better or a new coin a new term um, to get people to to really do the right um, process uh, for for that one. But yeah, I, I, there's a couple comments about you know learning management. Really, most learning management systems really are content management right now um in terms of that but still i look at it as look at how many people i still remember in march and april in the early days of the pandemic the news reports of schools that were you know running their copiers down to create packets of work for weeks for students versus those who could post it online and as much as it's you know it's still it's prog I, to me i still view it as progress um even though we want them to, we want everyone to go a lot lot farther So, anyone else have anything to add before we move on? Well, I what I think is interesting, Stephanie and and um, Alex, is that you know people who've been advocates for ed tech for a long time have been kind of waiting for everybody to catch up and to catch on, and and we've been trying to meet everybody where they're at, and then all of a sudden there was like this a massive push to get everybody going. And, and there were a couple of things that I thought about in, in regards to this discussion. One was there was only so much people could handle during the last year and a half. And so tool selection is something that's come up to me as being really important. Um, we picked three tools at the school I was formerly at to really focus our training on. And I just talked to a friend at another independent school who they had the big five that they wanted everybody to know. And so, you know, the balancing people's where people were at, the 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 critical tools, whether that's an LMS or something like Nearpod, it seemed to be part of the equation too. And then the time to make that happen, so that people felt adequately confident. And the the other piece of this too that we haven't done, I have not seen a lot of schools do is really have a deep discussion about what's worked and what hasn't and, and how their teaching has changed. And I think teachers need to hear it from themselves, like from their peers, and then it becomes much more powerful. And that debriefing, I'm wondering how many schools actually had took time at the beginning of the year to say, or maybe at the end of last year, to kind of say, hey, where are we at with all this? And I think that's really, really important. And I bet you anything, not a lot of schools have done much with that. And can, can I add in as well, um, you know, I think um, people catching up with tech, yeah, maybe, but all people were using Zoom for was a communication tool. Instead of physically coming into a school and standing in front of a classroom, it was now being used to communicate with the students, but in front of a screen. I mean, I'd be really curious as to the people that redesigned all of their curriculum, if you were to be truly creative and use it. Um, and I didn't see that much of it. And there, and there are tools that have come out since that I wish had been available before. So like right now, there are these third-party apps that work with Zoom um, that I think would add more interactivity. I've just started playing around with them. Or what's the one, they've changed their name a couple of times, I think, that is, it's the first, it was the first third-party app to build on top of the Zoom platform, and they were announced at Zoom's annual meeting. I think it's class tech or something. And they really kind of built the whole 
it's almost like an LMS and Zoom in one. And th those would have been really interesting to play with had we had them ahead of time, but they were they were built, it seems like in reaction to the to the pandemic. And well, so that I, might be the teaching a little bit. Right. And the the interesting thing from from my perspective is that the the in, in work, talking with teachers online and some of my own, those who sort of embraced the the Zoom as the as just the mechanism and loved the concept of breakout rooms and discussion groups and redesigned for stations and started started experimenting with flipped had a much better experience of pandemic learning than those who continued to do the stand in front of the room and lecture at the screen for a longer for a long period of time it, it was really there, 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 the dip, your level of flexibility in terms of comfort was a great determiner. Everyone was still tired at the end of it because it is still, it is a different, you're flexing a different set of, of brain muscles and a different set of, of interactive skills. Um, and you still, there's still the, the processing of how do you watch a screen full of people and communicate with the feedback. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's the, the Zoom was just a delivery, and we even talked about it as a delivery mechanism. It's not, it's not, it's, it's a part of your learning because it has to be. It's, you know, just like you, when, if you don't, if you can't talk to someone you're with, you're going to figure out a way to communicate with them when they're not in the room with you, you know, and it's going to be a wide variety. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit like the way Bill describes the learning management system, you know, mm -hmm. it's just a, a, a conduit to stuff. Not yep. necessarily the learning piece. Well, and and it turns out that it, if for even for ed tech relationships are what matters. The teachers who knew how to build relationships built relationships through Zoom. The teachers that don't and rely on a physical presence and authority didn't. And that's a that's a you you know that's a a huge perspective that that you know doesn't come across. And again, I also doesn't get talked about much. From, from the skill set of that's really what comes through and, and made a difference in a student's digital learning. Yeah, I think that was very evident. There was definitely, go ahead, Alex. Um, so yeah, okay. um, if we were to pull back the curtain, this is from Don's slide. Uh, he talked about how prior to uh, the pandemic, teaching was more like, a theater where you were face to face, you were on stage. And I think Mark alluded to that in the chat, stage on the stage. Um, and those that did teach in that manner struggled when we went to remote and we went to uh, virtual. So how can we use what we learned in this crisis as Don challenged us uh, uh, last week to think about how HBO is kind of giving us a new platform and a new way of learning similar to online learning. So how is HBO different than the theater is kind of the challenge that, that Don asked us to think about. So when we think about that, we're talking about redesigning our lessons. We're talking about redesigning the instruction because we can't talk for 30, 45 minutes on Zoom or pick, we, we're picking on Zoom, but it could be Google Meet, it could be WebEx, it could be any platform. But that is not, that lecture format is not going to work. The keynote presentations of conferences changed because they went virtual. So they went into small snippets. They went to spotlights of 10 minutes, 12 minutes, because there's lots of research actually uh, about attention span, believe it or not. And it, as far as your physical and mental of focusing on a screen, that amount of time that you can focus is less and less and less. And I think uh, Don talked about that a little bit. And I know we talked about that in our small groups in the last month or two about being able to be Zoom fatigued, right? That is all very, very real. There is lots of research prior to the pandemic about that. And we wanna think, okay, we know all this. We've had an opportunity to think about this for the last year and a half, two years now. So how can we use what would be some other ideas? Those are a few ideas that Alex and I talked about. What would be some other ideas that you can think of that we could learn after going through 
or we're still going through, as Lucy says, we're still going yeah. through this crisis. Yeah, and Bill has brought up in our, in our meetings prior to our public meetings, he brought up the idea of maybe having another discussion with teachers who've, who've adapted to teach, or, or maybe they already did teach pretty interactively to begin with. And I think it would be really interesting to have a panel to talk about like, this is how I do it. This is how I structure things. Because I think that creativity, uh, and it's all about creativity, which Don has alluded to in his, in his discussions too. So, you know, how are, we, how are we helping teachers to be creative and designers of learning experiences with the technology in this age of uncertainty is really kind of what I think is fascinating to me because I don't think that we're gonna be over this tomorrow. Maybe we'll be over it by January if, if, a, if a vaccine is available for, for kids under 12. But everybody I know right now that's in a school here in the US um, that's been going for a while, they've been going in and out. There've been grade levels that have had to quarantine. I, I think that's the new reality for right now. And if it's not COVID, maybe it's gonna be something else. I think we have to be prepared for any kind of scenario. And so I, I, I don't wanna get into the, what I'm afraid of is that we're gonna say virtual learning is bad, in-person learning is good. And that, that's an excuse, I think, for Luddites to say technology is bad. <laughs> you know, human interaction is, is best. And I, I do believe in, in person and human interactions for sure, but I don't, want to, I don't want to completely label it as a black and white thing. And what I'd like to explore is how do we, how do we, uh, how do we make things more interactive with this technology and, and how do we help teachers do that? Good. This is a question I'd like to explore further. I love that. Alex, Next slide, since Lucy gave that wonderful segue, uh, to just dive a little bit deeper. Again, uh, we use this, or I, I stole this from Don, and, uh, and we're trying to obviously integrate, because this is a four-part series, we're trying to integrate our previous friends and our future friends, uh, their work to try and keep this so that it's a, a learning experience that's not this one and done. So we do encourage you to go back and see both Don and Amy's if you have not already done so. Um, but with this, and so with what Lucy's saying is, do we throw remote learning out the window? Do we never offer teacher, you know, virtual teaching again? And that's not what we're saying. Uh, do we forget about online collaborations? That's absolutely not what we're saying. We're, what, what can we do to learn from them? And we even mentioned uh, flipped learning. Flipped PD has been around for several years. In fact, virtual learning and online learning has been around for several years. Uh, I received my third degree in a completely online format in 2005. So online learning uh, has been around for a while. I have taught in an online format in uh, not only where I currently am in a K-12 nonprofit organization, but also at graduate level for pre-service teachers for uh, well over 12, 13 years now. So it's not new. It's just, I think it was thrown on us and we weren't necessarily ready as, as a nation, uh, as a world, and as, as the uh, career path that we've all chosen in education. And it's been very, very interesting to look at corporations and how they have developed and learned and how they have shifted. If you look at Google, if you pick, pick one, right? They worldwide technology right here in St. Louis. They didn't have a very hard shift because they've been using a lot of the technologies uh, already because they are already, most of them, uh, teaching and learning as far as what they're doing. They're working from their, from their homes in Rome, in you know, uh, Guam, in the US, in various places. So what can we learn from not only our own uh, career path of education, but what can we learn from the world? So that's a question again. We're going to stop just for a moment if anybody wants to interject their thoughts on that. Anybody hear or see anything that they thought was interesting? Any connections? May I? I saw you run back to your <laughs> yes, you absolutely I'm, may, Mark. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm in, the, in the process of wiring up a Chromebook cart. So that's what I'm doing in the background there. I thought I'd let you guys watch. Awesome. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, in uh, 2019 and 2020, I was I was privileged to be able to have a uh, fellowship with uh, uh, an organization called Ignite Ed, and uh, I spent both of them at uh, Lockheed Martin uh, in Sunnyvale nearby here. And uh, the first one, uh, I worked on uh, a uh, classified uh, military communication satellite. Uh, you know, the thing was about the size of a small house and worth a couple of billion dollars. And the, my part of it was uh, completely virtual, uh, although I was on site and actually got to touch the thing, that was fun. Um, but uh, the thing I built was uh, in, uh, in with the cooperation of people in Denver, uh, people you know, a quarter of a mile away from me in other parts of the, of the Lockheed campus, people I sat across from uh, in the room. So, and these were not new experiences to me as a as a as an ed tech person to begin with, but they it, it, it's an indication that educators are able to do things like that, and uh, to experience the real the the real corporate world, you know, the the outside of outside of academia world, where these things are ordinary, where you, we're working virtually uh, is just the way things are done. It's not just something that we pull out of our butts because of COVID. Uh, it's the it is the real world, and um, I mean, look at what, what are we doing now? Uh, Fifteen years ago, this would have been unheard of. It's it's like talking about uh, you know we're teaching for the jobs of the future. We don't know what the fuck the jobs of the future are gonna be. Do not pardon my uh, my French. Uh, so you know that's that's the world I'm sitting in. In fact, the world I'm sitting in right now is is temporarily uh, my my base for putting the school back together uh, to, from having taken it apart for COVID and, and and having all these devices out in the homes. Uh, nor ordinarily, this is our flexible learning space with everything on wheels, and it have it has no no particular. Uh, uh, way of being set up. It's just, you know, however the, however the, the tables and chairs need to be for the learning goal in mind at the moment. So that's, that's where I'm at the moment. You know, piggybacking on what you're saying, Mark, um, uh, a friend of mine came, I, that I met, I don't know how long ago, 10 years ago now, uh, I, you, you, all of you may know Betsy Corcoran, who started Ed Surge, that's now part of ISTE. And she was the Silicon Valley reporter for Forbes, I believe, at one point. Um, she's interviewed all the, the big people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and things like that, I think, in her previous life. And she had taken a couple of years off of that work, I believe, and was toying. She didn't see this critical uh, adoption of technology in her kids' schools, who are about my kids' age. So, um, And she was really curious, like, when was that? that point going to come where it was just a given of, of, of that you use these tools as part of your work, just like you know, it happened to offices 25 years ago. Right. And so that, I think that has driven a lot of her work. Um, she's still writing for Ed Sturgeon, that sort of thing too. And, and, and to riff off of that too, the other thing that we might want to talk about at some point, Stephanie and Alex, is I was talking to a friend who works for an ed tech company and today and are texting with him. And he said that he hasn't seen a lot of products that have emerged from the pandemic that have wowed him. And it seems to be all about compliance, which was his comment. And I think that's the other thing that's been really disappointing to me. I think the tools that for, for me that worked really well at our school, one was Classkick, which is a small startup out of Chicago, which let people look at, at kids work um, without having to get super close to them. It's a really interesting tool. Padlet, Nearpod, these kind of open-ended book creator. Um, these were these kind of open-ended tools where people could create and show what they know were, were the ones that we relied on. And those have been around for a while. I didn't see anything necessarily that came out that was absolutely revolutionary. It's all about assessment or um, you know learning management systems or whatever I, I feel like the creativity has been zapped out of the ed tech world in terms of things and um i would love to see some new products that came out that did things differently i think flipgrid is, is also another example of something that's really morphed into something you know amazing 
Um, you know, it was originally created by a University of Minnesota professor and Microsoft bought it and has done amazing stuff with it. That's something to me, that's a tool that does things differently that changes the game. Where think, has that ecosystem gone? Well, that ecosystem disappeared because the entire school world, world transitioned to online and the, the dearth of tools to do the day-to-day -day things to quote unquote replicate the classroom in the digital world all the, the reason you i think you're seeing it as as you know that lack of creativity is because it became wait teachers used to hand out documents how how do we now replicate handing out documents online hence everything became an lms um everything became a document distribution system and everybody tried 30 ways from sunday to come up with a way to do it without actually thinking through what am I really trying to do? Where am I really going with this? And how can I make this process better? It's the, I'm so stressed from trying to make sure I stay alive and trying to make sure that my family, I have my job and my family is gonna stay alive and my friends are still alive, that how do I just replicate what I'm doing? How do I just keep going? And I think that's what we're seeing from the market and from the pieces at this point. And I'd like to add to that at this point, I, I totally agree, Alex, and Stephanie knows this as well as anyone with her work in SEL and my work that I've done in SEL, but it was a, it, it was a huge emotional crisis for everyone. Uh, and we're still recovering. And not only the emotional crisis that we've dealt with, uh, teachers, students, administrators, families, everyone, uh, but it, it, it was, it was like Maslow's hierarchy, you know, we need to flip it. You know, it was, what do we have to do just to keep going? What are the basic needs we have for education? Uh, and there were a zillion tools, you're exactly right. Uh, some worked, some didn't, and teachers were like, I don't know how many tools I can use. And so when you talked earlier, Lucy, about what worked, what didn't work, what could have been done better, and how I move forward, that's what I do in my action research with my grad students. Uh, and that's how I start my professional learning events with are with those, you know, we start we start with SEL, actually. Uh, and then we talk about the importance of that we talk about not stopping what we're doing with blended learning, but continuing to move forward. So yes, right now we have hurricanes in Texas. Why wouldn't we do this? We have refugees and, and refugee camps. Why wouldn't we do online learning? You never know. And that's the work I do with UNESCO for emergency and crisis and event, um, situations that you never know what's going to happen, whether it's a pandemic, a hurricane, an earthquake, a, a fire in California. Um, we need to be prepared. And it does when you talk about online collaborations. That's how we have our networks. That's how we all know each other. That's how we collaborate in lots of ways. And our kids can, too. So global education is all about online collaborations and flattening that global curve that we're really, we really are in one, one environment where we need to learn about each other and build those relationships. So I don't see it as being dead. Um, I, I think it's shifting. And I just think innovation, and I've had, you know, I was working with Tablet Academy and they're talking about AI in the US and, you know, right now, they're just not getting back into schools. They're looking at the other variants coming out. Innovation is like the farthest thing from some of their minds right now. They're still in how do we take what, how do we continue to survive? How do we take what we did learn and grow it? And yeah, maybe in October we can start being innovative, but it's like it's kind of hard to get them to jump out being innovative. And yet when they're doing their ESSER funding, their planning, all of that, they need to be thinking innovation. So it's it's a conundrum. Um, yeah, building on what Alex and Julene have just said, like, I think what we saw during the pandemic were what, are, what I call workarounds, uh, but there was an opportunity to how might we create um, great learning experiences, but it was just workarounds right through. And that's often, and, and like the way Julene, you're saying, it's like, it, what we really need was to innovate, but what happened was were workarounds because people can't, couldn't take it. You know. So speaking of that, Don, uh, Alex, next slide. So this was one of Don's workarounds. I, I, I'm going to call it that. He may not agree with me, but as I'm trying to segue to move this on. So we were talking about local learning and collaborations, and this was one of the things that Don shared with us in his talk about how he used a, a new, a rather new, uh, digital tool. He can drop that in the chat. I think it's called Mural, right? 
done. Yep. So what he did is he, of course, had face-to-face -face classes. So he had to spin on the dime or pivot. That's been the word through the pandemic. We had to pivot and it created new ways to collaborate in a digital format so that it could continue to change. And so the conversation was and still is uh, moving from the, I'm going to save this as a PDF and lock it versus no, we're going to keep this open and we're going to collaborate on this, uh, whether, whether it's a Google Doc, whether it's Miro, whatever it is, whatever digital tool, how can we then take that local learning and collaboration to then um, all over the world? Because whether or not uh, Don's students, let's just say they're all down below there and they're all from various countries, perhaps. Uh, there is no reason why we cannot learn, have that global learning and bring in experts from outside uh, to be to be assistants. Uh, some are actually using, and there's, I know there's controversy, but some are using Alexa as their teacher assistant. Uh, and so it works. So how can we think outside of the box? Uh, and with that, next slide, Alex, are multiple, we just kind of threw a bunch of different things, uh, organizations, uh, certifications, talking about the ISTE, the ISTE standards. Uh, uh, Alex is, uh, I think, CETL, right? Your COSIN yep. has CETA certified and I am ISTE certified. Uh, Future Ready is in that bottom right. These have all come out, uh, most of them, in the last, let's say, five years or so. Uh, or I should say um, adjusted, edited, changed a little. You've got your standard, uh, ISTE standards have been around for quite a while, but the most recent ones have been changed in the last few years and edited. Uh, EMINS has been around for about 15 years, uh, 20 years maybe, uh, and that has changed. That is in eight or 10 states and in Australia. Uh, it's based on the University of Missouri, Columbia, uh, SAMR in the bottom right, bottom right, and TPAC in the top left. Uh, those are just, and there could be Lodi. There's several levels of technology, thinking about technology, pedagogy. Uh, TPAC again is in that top right, or sorry, top left. Uh, TPAC is talking about technology, pedagogy, and knowledge, content knowledge. Uh, and you're trying to hit that sweet spot. So Keeping in mind that some of these conversations as far as ed tech is concerned have been around for quite a while. And what have people done in the last two to five years? They've adjusted them to middle of the road there, digital citizenship, self-care, all of that has been combined to say, hey, wait, there's technology, but there's this other thing called character and wellness. And we've got to address that whole child, whole school, uh, whole leader, and each of these organizations have come up uh, with a new way of thinking as far as ed tech is concerned. Uh, I'm sure there are others, if, if you know of others, I see some being dropped in the chat. Uh, Alex, if you want to name them or if somebody else wants to come off there, unmute and talk about other from local to global, what have we learned and how can we continue this learning and collaboration? And, and to speak to a little bit to what Julian was saying earlier, um, one of the things that I think is is key that I think a lot of us missed during the pandemic is that when it became time to do something in response to what was going on, um, that extra five, now we, now we can at least think about it in retrospect, but taking that extra five minutes, it's not like any of these were not out there and there was probably somebody in most districts and in most areas that could have helped find one of these models or supports or infrastructures or COSIN is great from the, I'm going to call it from the privacy infrastructure, um, trusted environment type setup with literally checklists and plans and, and things to follow. Um, same thing from being the, the, the ed tech leader perspective of, thing, of ways to train and things to look at and things to follow using TPAC, SAMR, TIMS, all the other different models to address what we were going to do as part of the pandemic. One of the thing, again, one of the things that I know we used, we keep calling what we, we have, what we call a culture of thinking. And we use uh, thinking maps and visible thinking throughout the school. That is our chosen pedagogy. And every time we talk about which tools we use, they have to be able to support those methodologies. 
and those pieces. And we don't pick tools that can't support some aspect of them. Um, and that's the huge um, difference in terms of making that, you know, choosing that response and then figuring out how we're going to help guide our faculty and eventually our students into the right path. I agree. And I think William's added some things there in, in previous conversation. Uh, I think Lucy maybe talked about those. And whenever I teach, <laughs> whether I'm teaching K-12 teachers or whether it's graduate level, don't take more than a handful. Your mother always told you that, right? So what happened was we had tools and tools and tools and tools thrown at us uh, a year and a half, two years ago, and we grasped. And so that's uh, Don's response. And we did what we could, right? Uh, with whatever tools we could. However, there's only three to five tools probably that we need in our tool belt at all times. Uh, and those tools we can get creative with. That's where the innovation and creation has come from. And one such tool that's been around for a very long time is YouTube. And this is my segue for uh, my partner in crime, <laughs> for, Alex. For the story about, that Lucy teased in the intro. To talk about how that particular tool has become helped uh, a person become innovative and creative. Alex. So we want to, I want to tell a little bit of a story and we're kind of posing it as the, the influencer versus the innovator and the, the challenge that we have in helping students make progress towards um, being able to really leverage their technology to make a difference. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the concept of Zoom bombing um, that happened and became news stories all over the place as students um, and classes were online and, and people would share either publish, openly publish links or um, students would uh, basically send links to people in order to get people to come in and Zoom bomb their classes. Um, I was fortunate and unfortunate enough to experience a situation like this. Um, and we, we, you know, we had some students who wanted to do it just to be goofy and fun and we were able to track them down. Um, Zoom has some really cool tools um, that we can go on and we'll have to create a little article on because Lucy was fascinated when I showed her how we could actually track where people were coming from. Um, so I actually, we got a Zoom bomber who decided to um, record their harassment of our teacher and a couple students and then post on YouTube. Um, the students then started publishing the YouTube, we found it and then had the unique opportunity to try and track and follow what was going on. Um, because they blurred faces and blurred names, YouTube refused this, refused to take, refused to take it down because there was no private information being shown. Um, again, going back to our previous conversation in the chat with US privacy laws and some flaws that may exist in the process. Um, so I just continued to dig. Um, and I was able, because the, the person involved turned out to be a sophomore in high school who obviously was bored in their original classes, spent their day setting up social media accounts to solicit, um, solicit Zoom links from students to come in and then highlight the videos on his YouTube channel where he explained that he wanted to basically become a streamer. That was his goal. His goal was to basically have a job as a type of influencer, um, to basically have people follow what he did and participate in his life or whatever he wanted to stream at the time. Now, the irony is, and we've had a couple behind the scenes conversations about this, um, the student actually showed great initiative in setting up all the digital, the digital channels, um, actually had a merchandise page for his logo and set everything up, um, branded well. Um, his screen presence was actually pretty good on the intros and everything else. Um, the big problem became that the student who wants to basically have a position of, of influence using technology was basically doing something that in most cases would, you know, if, he, if there was somebody who was running around a school, barging into classrooms and yelling some of the things or doing some of the things that he was doing, they'd be expelled and or arrested uh, for trespassing and other things. And in the digital world, that just wasn't going to happen due to the volume and the, the, the difficulty of, of tracking down these things. 
So it becomes this really unique situation of um, seeing how you, we actually do the right thing in terms of teaching them tools, teaching students tools. Like this, to me, the school had a missed opportunity. Like he actually went, I created videos about how people were calling and complaining and he got in trouble at his school and his school and his parents basically told him, just lay low and don't do it to our school and we won't, we won't interrupt what you're doing or complain. We're not, as long as you don't do it to our school, we won't discipline you. Um, and the parents obviously were backing his merchandise store and providing him with his room and his computer and everything else. Um, so it's really an interesting, you know, sort of case study in what happens when you create a digital environment for students and get them to understand how to use a tool, but then don't give them the resources on how to now conduct yourself in a professional manner to get where you want to go. Uh, now I, I have been following the student. The student has gone from basically trolling high school teachers to trolling other people online. And the content is now getting to the, I'll call it questionable areas in terms of harassment type um, and bullying type situations. Um, but again, this person's stu stated goal is, I wanna be a streamer and an influencer. And they don't have that connection of the actions that they're taking while getting them views are not something that they necessarily wanna build a reputation around. And it's an interesting thing because this student could literally be almost teaching a class in their school on how to get students online and build a digital presence. But the example that they're setting is one that we probably wouldn't want students to follow. So it, it, it's really an interesting, you know, conundrum. So I think there are, as an opposite example, Alex, <laughs> of. <laughs> that I've been thinking about this week has been um, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and, mm -hmm. um, and the Green brothers, John Green and Hank Green. I, I've, I've listed them in presentations before as kind of like, you know, the, the 21st century student is, is grown up now. You know, we talked 15 years ago about like what, how to prepare kids for their future. Well, those kids are living their futures right now. And like, they're adults and they're doing really interesting things with those, those, those soft skills that we think are so important. And I'm not so sure that they've learned them in school. Um, anyway, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I'm going to write a post about it this week because he did an interview that I thought was really powerful about teachers um, because he has this program on Apple, um, on Apple TV, Apple plus TV, whatever it's called. Um, that, that just aired about, about teachers. And, um, and I just watched the first episode. Anyway, he, what's interesting, if you have not seen what he's doing, you know, acting, he's grown up in the acting world and is really interested in all that, obviously in creativity, he, he admires teachers and, and project. And basically what he's doing is online project-based learning with adults. So he has this community that's been going for about 10 years called Hit Record where you're, you go in and you can, um, you can use the app or you can go on the website and you can contribute to different digital artworks. It could be a, a movie, it could be writing, it could be, um, you know, photography, it could be simply just like uploading a picture. And he's always putting out prompts over Twitter saying, hey, I need a, a voice actor and, you know, no experience necessary or whatever. And so you can go and you can contribute to these these projects of, of kids working, or it's adults actually, you know, it's not just kids working across um, borders to be creative together. It's unbelievable. Um, so I highly take, uh, I, I highly recommend taking a look at that platform because that's the kind of, the kid that you're talking about, we want him to channel his energy towards something like this, that's doing mm -hmm. something positive and, and, and doing some good in the world. And I'm just every time I look at it hit record, I'm just blown away by by what is going on in there. And I think it's really interesting um, for this audience. So with that, I'll be quiet. Well, thank you, Lucy. I know we're at the tail end, but I do want to say and help me. Is it Hans Beacon? Is that right? Help me. I know you've been contributing a lot. Can you, do you mind unmuting and talking about? Yeah, I'm Hannes Becker, yes. I'm from Germany. 
you've been ta you've been sharing a lot in the chat and i know sometimes we don't necessarily catch the chat in the recording but i i want to go back to a, a little bit ago um specifically talking about the differences in germany and what you've seen there and anything else uh you know you want to add at the end of our conversation because i know most of us i think on this call are um here in the in the us um i'm trying to scroll through real quickly but if you want to Kind of reiterate some of the highlights. Uh, we want to make sure that we get that on our recording of what's happening in Germany. Well, many observations uh, are the same in Germany. Uh, so it sounds familiar for me. And, um, but <clears throat> my, my wife is a principal and her school had the chance that every uh, teacher and every student received an iPad in the very beginning of the pandemic. And uh, we live in Thuringia, which is a, a part of Germany that's far, far back uh, in uh, digital learning. Uh, I'm originally from Hamburg and Hamburg is far ahead. And now in Thuringia, I can do things I did 20 or 30 years ago in Hamburg. Um, so uh, this pandemic was really interesting for me because uh, everything that did, did work and did not work showed up. And uh, in the very specific um, case of the school of my wife, it worked out wonderful. It was really a kind of a fresh start and everybody joined it. Uh, even the teachers who are uh, one year before retirement, they learned to use the, the iPad for teaching and, and learning and uh, started to uh, become really uh, creative. So uh, in that specific case, it was a wonderful experience, but I've seen many, many worst cases too because I do teacher training and I go to different schools and uh, try to start uh, something in these schools. And some of these schools are, well, I would say uh, 30 years ahead, uh, 30 years back uh, from anything uh, we want to do. So this is a really interesting time because they suddenly felt the urge uh, to change something and are totally not prepared. And yeah. then I show up and tell them uh, what I did 30 years ago. And it, it's, a, it's a crazy situation at the very moment. The it's funny thing is uh, I'm 11 years past my personal retirement. I'm uh, 76 now. So, um, I started teaching with, uh, uh, with Apple computers in 1989. And uh, uh, now I can repeat all that uh, experiences uh, in, in the Turinian schools. And this is really funny. And what, what's obvious for me is that there's an incredible gap between uh, some parts of Germany and other parts of Germany. And the interesting thing too is that uh, the school board has a tendency to give all the money to one school, a uh, pilot school or something like that. And uh, that the outcome is that there are uh, schools that are really ahead of everything and other schools that are, well, other schools didn't even start. And uh, as a teacher trainer, I have to deal with it. This is really interesting. Uh, <laughs> the funny thing is uh, 11 years uh, after my retirement, I can make a lot of money because <laughs> I'm still in the business as a freelancer now. And, uh, uh, but in the, in the 90s or in the late 80s or early 90s, uh, I didn't know what uh, PBL was, we had no name for it. But uh, later on, I realized that everything I did was PBL. And we had interesting projects with universities and schools in the United States. 
For instance, in 1996, I had a project. We, uh, in uh, my class in Germany and a class in a high school in Salt Lake City, they compared uh, the production of uh, the, the, the usage of gas, gasoline, and the production of CO2 in one week. And the funny thing was, a normal American family had four cars or five cars or six cars. And many German families had no cars at all. <laughs> so it was an incredibly difference in uh, the production of CO2. And we did this in 96, and I think uh, this approach is so modern, <laughs> it's still so modern. And I wonder, uh, but I think we should go back to things like these. Uh, combine uh, a class in the US with a class in Germany and talk about interesting subjects that are part of their daily life. And yeah. uh, uh, it's so easy. Yep, my organization did that years ago with that video conferencing that's been around. You know, we used that H.263 at that point. They didn't have Zoom and Google Meet and all these others. And I do think oh, that's that's you've got some valid have, points, valid yeah. valid points. So we, I know our did. time is is sh yeah. short. I want to make sure that Lucy wraps it up, and I would love to have this continue the conversation. But I want to make sure that we've uh, yeah we'll let, let me, people go. But Lucy, yeah. I know that you've got more. We have more. Uh, yeah, one, one more person I know, uh, maybe you too, uh, yes. later this week. So where do we go from here, Lucy? Yeah, so next, uh, so this week we, so if you're interested in, in joining our group, my email is up there. If you want to get more involved and in join our Slack group and and um, just email me and, and we'll talk about that. Um, we're more than happy to have you join us. We also are on social media. You, you can find us at linktree slash actionable inno and then our next conversation is on friday and this is not necessarily applicable to everyone because it's only for u.s schools and public schools but i think there's room for continuing this ed tech conversation that we're having today so in the u.s for those of you who are not familiar with us we have lots of money coming from the government to schools as part of stimulus, um, federal stimulus money to deal with COVID. And the third round is just starting to appear in, in states and each state and each district within those states had to submit a plan of some sort. And there was a lot of, um, there was a, a fair amount of leeway that people had to say how they wanted to use this funding. And so, I mean, we're talking billions of dollars here. And uh, Kurt, who is one of the people who's supposed to lead the discussion on Thursday, said that his district was sitting on money that they did not know what to do with. And so I thought we would give a brief overview of what this is, just to kind of clue people in, give some resources, and then discuss what are some creative and smart ways to use this money so that's impactful. And I think this also might be of interest to people who are not directly related to this topic just to think about like, how are, we, how are we allocating money for innovation in general? And so that's our next meeting, which is on Thursday. And then we're starting, um, once we've gotten our, this, this, this four kind of kickoff series done, we're going to start meeting every Friday at 1 p.m. Uh, Central Time, which is GMT minus five. Um, and, our, our, and Bill Rankin, who's in the audience is going to be kicking that off Friday, September 24th. And we have another one scheduled for October 15th and probably some more coming. The October 15th one will be on um, a maker project, a STEAM project uh, that's a partnership between Barnard College in New York City and the New York um, Public Parks um, by Kelly Gray. So I think you guys will all like that. So that's what's coming up and there'll be more coming as I get them scheduled. And, and mine's going to be about thinking about new kinds of assessment. Um, and I'm, I, I promise the blurb is almost written, Lucy, and I will send it to you shortly. <laughs> but, but thinking about especially the ways that standardized assessment becomes an excuse for not doing the kind of innovative work we've been talking about and, and maybe is even a discouragement from problem-based, project-based, challenge-based, maker learning. And so thinking about, so I, I've been working on a structure and we're just gonna have a, a conversation. 
great. That's awesome. And the thing is too, you know, Bill, what's interesting to me is that I thought like four years ago, like under Ernie Duncan or five or six years ago, they were talking about redoing assessments and, and having 21st century assessments out there. And then I thought Tony Wagner was working on something at one point. And then I never saw anything that ever happened from that. So I'm, I'll be really interested to hear what your take is on the landscape, if there is any, around rethinking assessments. Thank okay, uh, I'm going to stop recording and we can do, um, we can sit around and chat a little bit more if you guys would like to, I would love to, but I think I'm gonna stop streaming and stop um, recording. So thanks for coming everyone. We'll see you on Thursday. And if you wanna stay around, we're here. Uh,